Welcome to this proof of concept video. So today I want to give some down to earth, visually motivated definitions that get to the heart of a number theory. Integers are made up, at least from the perspective of multiplication, by their factors. We'll talk about primes, dividing, factors, greatest common factor, and least common multiple. Our goal today isn't the formalism, it's the intuition. But once we have some intuition, we'll see what the formal definition has to be and why. So, the integers. I'm a number theorist, which means I study integers. Integers do a lot of interesting things, but at their core, there are two fundamental operations, addition and multiplication. Each of these is relatively simple on its own. So addition arranges the numbers on a number line, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, with each one more than the last. Adding three to five is just taking three steps beyond five, or maybe five steps beyond three. Multiplication is also fairly simple on its own. So there are some atoms, which are called primes, which combine to give everything else. And you're basically allowed to put them together however you wish. I can take two threes, a five, and an 11, and the result is 495, a perfectly good number. Most of what makes number theory interesting has to do with the way these two operations interact. So if I put together my atoms in different ways, how do I know which result is bigger on the number line? The atoms themselves, the primes, lie rather unpredictably among the ordered march of integers up the number line. So how exactly are they placed? Numbers with nice multiplicative forms like perfect powers, can they add up to one another? Is every even integer the sum of two primes? This is what keeps number theorists busy. Well, sort of. What I love about number theory often has to do with the unexpected ways that it connects to other areas of mathematics and real life like geometry and cryptography. Anyway, today we're just going to focus on multiplication. So, as you know, we have the primes. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on. Let's think of them as building blocks. Every integer can be broken down as a product of primes. And more than just that, there's only one unique expression as a product of primes, at least provided that you don't care about the order, and you throw in the right sign, so plus or minus, into the mix. We sometimes talk about one number dividing another. We often first think of 3 divides 12 as the statement that if you take 12 into three parts, the resulting parts are integers and not fractions. That's a bit roundabout from my perspective, though, because it requires talking about fractions and dividing. So it's more natural to say that 3 divides 12 because 12 is a multiple of 3. Then it's just multiplication we're talking about. So both are valid, of course, but as a mathematician, we try to start with the integers and worry about fractions later. So this is my definition. Let a and b be integers. We'll say that a divides b if there's an integer c such that a times c is b. So uh, here we have 3 divides 12 because I can write 12 as a multiple of 3. So what am I taking as the c? I'm taking the 4. Okay, so a couple of quick notes. First, we have a nice notation for this. We write a divides b with a vertical line. Now, this notation is a whole grammatical sentence. It says A divides B, which is a statement about truth in the universe. Don't confuse it with the fraction notation, which actually denotes a number. So they're totally different things. Okay, so much for the formalism. We've got primes in mind, so let's visualize the notion of divides in terms of prime building blocks. So for this, I'm going to think of a number built from primes, like a castle built from blocks. So pink blocks will be twos, blue blocks will be threes, green blocks will be fives, and so on. So 15 looks like this, and 12 looks like this, and 60 looks like this. Now, the most helpful intuition for divides is to think of it visually. So one number, say A, divides another number, B, if you can build B by adding blocks to the castle you've already got from A, and without having to take anything away. So with the blocks we have on the screen, you can see that 12 divides 60 because we have to add one single green block to make the 12 castle turn into the 60 castle. You can also see that 15 divides 60, we just have to add two pink blocks. But 12 doesn't divide 15 because 12 has too many pink blocks. You'd have to take them away to build the 15 castle. Okay, so that's it. That's divides. It seems simple, but this way of visualizing things will come in handy all over the place. One of the first concepts you meet in number theory, including in applications to cryptography, is the greatest common divisor, often called a GCD for its initials. So this is a deceptively simple concept that turns out to be absolutely central. So the greatest common divisor is just the largest number dividing the two you're given, the greatest common divisor. 
Let's take 12 and 15. We just saw that they don't divide each other. So what's their greatest common divisor? Well, it's their shared architecture, the blocks that they have in common. So if we overlay them on one another, each of them has some extra stuff, but the common stuff is their GCD. So in this case, it's just the single blue block, the three. If we're writing numbers, not blocks, it's really the same game under a different notation. I write 12 as 2 squared times 3, 15 as 3 times 5, and their GCD is 3. Here's another example for you to try, 280 and 30. So pause the video right here and figure out what's the GCD. Okay, so here's what I did. I looked for what's in common. So we have a 5 in both places, and we've got a 2, but actually just one of them is in common, even though 280 has several 2s. So the answer is just a single 2 and a single 5. 2 times 5, or 10. Okay, pop quiz. Suppose that I write n as p1 to the e1 times p2 to the e2, and so on and so forth through pn to the en. And similarly, m with the same p's but different exponents. So what am I doing here? Um, I'm writing them down in a factored form. So the pi's stand for primes. And then I give the exponents telling you how often that prime appears. So it may appear with some multiplicity. So for example, p1 appears in n e1 times and appears f1 times inside m. So I could even let e1 be 0 if p1 doesn't actually appear in the factorization of n. So that means if I've got two numbers, I can write them this way just by allowing some zeros if I need in terms of the same set of primes. So I'll just take the p1 through pn to be all the primes that I might need in this situation. OK, so that's just a way of writing down two numbers. Um, so now with this, this formalization, this way of writing things, how can I express the GCD in a similar way? OK, pause the video and figure out um, how to write this down for yourself. OK, so here's what I had in mind. So I can write the GCD of n and m as p1 to the minimum of e1 and f1, p2 to the minimum of e2 and f2, and so on. So the idea here is that if there are, for example, three 11s in n and five of them in m, then they have three in common, the minimum of three and five. That's how many they share. So that's how many are in the GCD. So that's the exponent that I put on that prime in the notation. So this is just a nice mathematical formalism for what we were drawing as castles before. So there's a lot of value in the simplicity of this, but don't take it for granted. The price of the simplicity is that you need to be able to factor your number to take, your, both of your numbers, to take the GCD. If you can't see the factors, then you're at a loss. So for example, what's the GCD of these two big numbers? Well, in fact, it's 7. But factoring large numbers is notoriously difficult. In fact, the difficulty lies at the core of modern public key cryptography. But amazingly, there's a very efficient algorithm to compute the GCD without ever having to factor. So it's such an amazing algorithm, it's called the Euclidean algorithm, that I think of it as one of the most fundamental algorithms in mathematics. Before we move on, let's figure out what the formal definition of the GCD needs to be. So we could state it in terms of the factorizations above, but that depends on a whole lot of background about primes and such like. So even though it's the best for intuition, we prefer for the definition to depend on as little previous knowledge as possible. So we say the following. Definition. Let's let a and b be integers. Then the greatest common divisor of a and b, denoted gcd of a and b, is the largest integer g, such that g divides both a and b. So it's just the greatest common divisor. So a quick footnote here. Um, some prefer a definition that goes something like this. G divides A and B and if anything else divides A and B then that other thing also divides G. It's a bit more roundabout but it does have certain virtues. Um, but it's the same thing in the end. So we'll actually stick to the more intuitive one that I have written here. But it does provide a good opportunity for a pop quiz. Is it true that any other divisor of A and B must also divide the GCD of A and B. So pause the video and explain why. Okay, I think this one is easiest from the perspective of the factorization. So if the GCD is the biggest common piece of the factorization, then in particular, it includes all of the common factors. 
So the cousin of the GCD is the LCM, which stands for least common multiple. It's the smallest number, which is a multiple of both your given numbers, least common multiple. In terms of the picture, it's the smallest castle that contains both the other castles. So for 12 and 15, the LCM has to contain two pink twos, one blue three, and one green five. It has to contain everything you need to make 12 and everything you need to make 15, but nothing extra. So the answer is 60. Okay, pause the video here and compute the least common multiple of 77 and 121. Okay, I did this by factoring. So 77 is 7 times 11, and 121 is 11 squared. So the least common multiple has to have 1 7 and 2 11s. So it's 7 times 11 squared, which is 847. All right, so finally, one last pop quiz. So suppose I write my numbers like I did before as prime factorizations. Now, how can I express the LCM, kind of like we did for the GCD? Go ahead and pause the video and let me know. Okay, I got that the LCM looks like this. So on each prime, the number of um, copies of that prime that I have to take in the least common multiple is the max of the number you see inside n and the number you see inside m. So that means that the exponent on p1 is the max of the exponents e1 and f1, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there you have it for divides, GCD, and LCM. In a follow-up video, I'm going to tackle the Euclidean algorithm and how it can find the greatest common divisor of two integers without ever knowing their factorizations.